Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Israeli forces shoot Palestinian man 10 times while he sleeps in his bed in the West Bank. Sarkozy denounces attack on Middle East Christians. And Iraqi protesters demand expulsion of anti-Iranian group. Mosaic, World News from the Middle East, begins now. Early in the morning, Israeli occupation forces killed an elderly Palestinian man who was sleeping in his home in the southern West Bank city of Hebron. The victim, Omar Kawasmi, was 66 years old. Israeli forces stormed Kawasmi's house and opened fire on him before arresting several Hamas members. Palestinian authorities released them yesterday following Qatari mediation. Our correspondent in Hebron, Shirin Abu Akla, has the details. The scene needs no comment. 66-year-old Omar al-Kawasmi was sleeping at home in Hebron city when Israeli special forces surrounded him, killing him in cold blood. More than 10 bullets pierced the martyr's body. Occupation forces fired at him while he was sleeping without asking his family members his name or identity. One of them came and held me like this. The others immediately shot him. Even before they came in, they started shooting him while he was sleeping. The Israeli army considers the murder a mistake and said it would open an investigation into the matter. According to the army, the target of the raid was a young man named Wael al-Bitar, who lives in a nearby house and was arrested shortly afterward. Al-Bitar is one of the five Hamas members released by Palestinian security authorities on Thursday. Israeli occupation forces arrested them soon afterward, claiming they were wanted by its security agencies. The arrests negatively impacted the already tense relationship between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. Hamas holds the authority responsible for the arrests, while Hamas supporters initiated a demonstration denouncing what they refer to as security coordination between the Palestinian Authority and Israel. Both the occupation and the authority are responsible. If these people were not arrested by the authority's security institutions, the occupation wouldn't have received information about them. We believe the occupation is directly responsible for everything it does to create the Palestinian situation. The six detainees had gone on an open hunger strike in the authority's prison that lasted more than 40 days. The authority released them after an order was issued by the Palestinian president. The detainees had been held by the authority for two years when the high court issued the decision to release them. Everyone knows that there was an intervention by the emir of Qatar in many countries and many brothers inside the Green Line. The release was also a response to the judicial court court's decision. Security coordination was initiated as soon as the authority and President Abu Mazen responded to these efforts. Every city and village, even every house in the West Bank is humiliated by Israel. But it is strange that Israeli violations that should have been a motive to bring the Palestinians closer are still a tool used by Israel to deepen Palestinian division. Shirin Abu Akla, Al Jazeera, occupied Hebron. Open with the death of an elderly Palestinian in Hebron early this morning who died after an apparently accidental shooting by IDF troops during the unit's mission to re-arrest five Hamas prisoners released from jail one day earlier. IBA's Dennis Zinn has more. IDF troops shot and accidentally killed 65-year-old Omar Kawasme early this morning while trying to arrest a Hamas terrorist who lived in the same building. The IDF spokesman expressed regret for the incident, adding that a quick investigation has been ordered and the results will be issued next week. Palestinian witnesses said that the shooting took place on the first floor of an apartment building in central Hebron while troops were searching for one of the five prisoners released from the city's jail yesterday. 
The dead man was identified as an uncle of one of the Hamas prisoners being sought. They both lived in the same building. Meanwhile, troops succeeded in rounding up all five men during a number of raids across the city. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas had ordered the release of six Hamas prisoners being held on security grounds who were on a hunger strike, five in a Hebron jail, while the sixth was in Bethlehem. In Gaza today, the Hamas held a rally to protest the death in Hebron. Thousands gathered and vowed revenge. Earlier in the day, IDF jets struck a terror base in northern Gaza and a smuggling tunnel in the south. The IDF confirmed there were direct hits. No injuries were reported. The IDF spokesman said that the airstrike was in response to mortar fire at Israel yesterday. In the last two days, terrorists have lobbed eight rockets into Israel. As part of the weekly protest against construction of the security fence, hundreds of Palestinians, Israelis and international activists today marched in the West Bank town of Bielin. The demonstration was unusually large as many participated in anger over last week's death of 36-year-old Palestinian Jawahir Abu Rameh. IDF troops sealed entrances to the village near Ramallah in an effort to prevent the demonstration, but the protesters managed to evade security forces through fields or holes cut in surrounding fences. Meanwhile, the commander of the Judea and Samaria Division, Brigadier General Nitzan Alon, announced earlier today that documents received from official Palestinian sources confirmed that Abu Rama's death was not caused by inhalation of tear gas fired by IDF troops at last week's Bielin protest. Alon says that the IDF is now convinced that Abu Rama's death was caused by other illnesses and the method of medical treatment received by the victim. Alone said that while data indicates the woman was not present at the protest, gusts of tear gas carried by wind may have reached her, but Alone reiterated that it did not cause her death. The Brigadier General said that several details need to be sorted out and that further talks will be held with Palestinian officials to reach a final understanding on Abu Rama's death. Alone went on to stress that there is a difference between peaceful protest and the violence that has become characteristic of the Belin demonstrations, saying that the IDF will continue to use crowd dispersal methods, including the use of tear gas, when required to quell violent clashes. Egypt's cops celebrated Christmas amid tightened security measures after the Two Saints Church in Alexandria was attacked last week, leaving dozens killed and injured. Egyptian authorities deployed a large number of police equipped with armoured vehicles and experts in explosives to protect the churches. Khaled Ez Al Arab has the details. This year's Christmas celebration is different. It would be fair to say that these are the tightest security measures witnessed in Egypt in the past several years. This street is normally bustling with activity, but not tonight. In order to reach the church, people who have invitations must pass through at least five checkpoints. Those who were not invited are not allowed into the church, even to pray. The night ended peacefully as the tight security made it difficult for breaches to occur, peacefully but not without sorrow. I think security and everything was good, but of course we're not enjoying the celebration. We came tonight to mourn. We can't feel the joy of the holidays. Not a single person dressed up. Personally, I won't be celebrating and won't allow my children to celebrate the holiday. Celebrities flock to the cathedral, including politicians, journalists and entertainers. For the first time, state-owned and private TV channels in Egypt covered the event. First, I want to offer my condolences to the people of Alexandria and elsewhere for the martyrdom of so many innocent people.
رغم أن الهجوم على كنيسة القديسين كان حادثا مؤلما للمصريين. Even though the attack on the two saints church was a painful incident for all Egyptians, especially Copts, many feel the resulting solidarity between Muslims and Christians may be a light of hope for the future. Khaled Al Arab, BBC, Cairo. القاهرة. من جهته ندد الرئيس الفرنسي نيكولا ساركوزي بالهجمات التي تعرض لها مسيحيون French President Nicolas Sarkozy condemned the attacks on Christians in the Middle East. He said these attacks are part of a wicked religious cleansing plan to expel Christians from the region. Addressing religious leaders in France, Sarkozy said that he could not keep quiet about the threats against Coptic churches in France and the attacks on the Coptic churches in Egypt. استهدفت الكنائس القبطية في مصر أكيد لا يمكن السكوت عليها. We cannot accept and thereby facilitate what looks more and more like a particularly perverse program of religious cleansing in the Middle East. In Iraq and Egypt, Eastern Christians live in their homeland, and most of them have been there for 2,000 years. We cannot allow this human, cultural, and religious diversity, which is the norm in France, Europe, and most of the Western world, to disappear from the Middle East. In a mere two days, southern Sudan will decide its fate. As the media campaign for the referendum comes to a close, a mass rally calling for secession is taking place in the city of Juba. Secession raises many questions about the economic future of the south, especially for the city of Juba, considered one of the most expensive cities in the world, despite the fact that most residents live in extreme poverty. Poverty. Our correspondent Sami Shanawi reports from Juba. <laughs> Here in Juba, it seems unimaginable to fish in the Nile. Instead, one has to wait for boats from neighboring Kenya and trucks from neighboring Uganda to supply all sorts of merchandise. Even though Juba is still part of North Sudan, it lacks many goods because of the long distance. Merchants here complain about high prices. Prices in Juba are very high. I don't know why. I don't know why they're so high. Prices rise every single day, every day. As merchants, the price of goods we buy rises every day. According to official figures, Juba's rising prices are incompatible with the average person's income, which does not exceed one dollar per day. The middle class barely exists in South Sudan. Our modest income makes life difficult, especially under these circumstances. A modest income is no longer enough as it was in the past. It's hard right now, very hard. Everything is expensive. I don't know why everything is this expensive. Rising prices are blamed on the lack of local income sources and the absence of local production. Juba only produces mineral water and alcoholic beverages, resulting in southern Sudan's complete reliance on imported goods from Dubai, Kenya and Uganda. We have no factories here and we're coming out of war. It ended in 2005, so not that long ago. We haven't had time to build factories. Growth of the construction sector is visibly absent, probably due to the numerous wars that have prevented the South from developing. However, Juba is unique in that it is one of the most expensive cities in the world. The city prides itself for its ability to host people in one of its luxurious hotels, where the price ranges between $2,000 and $7,500 per month. This is completely inconsistent with the prevailing poverty visible on the streets of the city. Southern Sudan might eventually completely rely on oil revenue, since the excessive presence of foreigners has limited job opportunities, rendering Juba a city impossible to comprehend on the basis of economic measures. Three more U.S.-led foreign forces have been killed in two separate bomb attacks in Afghanistan. With only a week into 2011, and there's already been at least nine foreign soldiers killed in a war-torn country, 2010 was a record-breaking year for all the wrong reasons. 711 foreign soldiers lost their lives in Afghanistan, the biggest number since the war began in 2001. We're going to cross over to Kabul, where Press TV's correspondent Faiz Horsheed is standing by to update us about the latest uh, casualties 
that NATO has uh, had at least nine foreign soldiers' fires uh, since the start of the year. We're not even a week into it. What can you tell us about the most recent NATO deaths? Well, now, I guess these three NATO soldiers were killed in separate roadside bomb attacks in the south and eastern parts of this country. These are believed to be the main battlefields for the foreign troops stationed here. And roadside bombs are the biggest killer of the foreign troops stationed here in Afghanistan. And these bombs have inflicted heavy casualties on U.S. and NATO soldiers here, especially in 2010, that became the deadliest year for the foreign soldiers uh, in Afghanistan since this war has begun nine years ago. But the latest deaths in 2011 has not taken many here by surprise, where because U.S.-led commanders here have already admitted that they, 2011 would also be a tough year for them. But as, uh, if you see the, the deaths that took place in 2010, most of those deaths took place in the southern parts of this country, where NATO and U.S. soldiers launched many operations against the Taliban militants. But those operations have further worsened things here and made the Taliban more aggressive. You see the Taliban attacks are increasing, and 2010 was not only a grim start for the foreign troops but also for Afghan people because today in Kandahar province a deadly explosion happened. The explosion took place in the spin building the city of Kandahar province in a public bathhouse where people were taking bath before their Friday prayers. The bomber exploded his explo explosives and we understand that 17 Afghans were killed and over 20 others were injured by this explosion. Right after the explosion, the Taliban claimed responsibility and like many other of their attacks, this explosion has also angered the Afghan government and raised serious condemnations. The Afghan president from his presidential palace issued a statement strongly condemning this and said it was a brutal attack. But the timing of these latest attacks are, is very important. This, these latest attacks come at a time as the U.S. is planning to send 1,400 more U.S. Marines to the southern parts of Afghanistan to fight against the Taliban militants. Iraqis protested in front of the Ashraf camp in Diyala province, north of Baghdad, demanding anti-Iranian terrorist group mujahideen e khalq organization, the NKO, be expelled from Iraq. A large number of tribesmen and distinguished leaders took part in the protest. Our al Alam correspondent reported that MKO members responded by throwing rocks at the demonstrators, injuring several people, damaging some media equipment. Protesters issued a statement demanding the UN and the Iraqi government shut down the Ashraf camp and expel the group from the country. The Iraqi government said the constitution does not allow any organization to operate on Iraqi soil if it attacks neighboring countries. The Imam of Kufa Mosque, Sheikh Assad al-Nasiri, quoted Muqtar al-Sadr, the head of the Sadrist movement, during a Friday sermon, saying that the end of occupiers and invaders in Iraq is soon. He added that Iraq will remain home to its noble people. This beloved country is home to its honorable people, despite the wishes of its oppressors. It will never be home to the invaders, havoc wreakers, and occupiers. The spokeswoman for the EU foreign policy chief, Catherine Ashton, said the next round of nuclear talks with Iran will take place on January 20th in the Turkish city of Istanbul. Acting Iranian Foreign Minister Ali Akbar Salehi said talks will focus on a package of Iranian proposals, including nuclear, security, and economic issues. Salehi added that all related issues can be ironed out if a special team is assigned to work on each file. He further said Iran was making its good intentions in regard to its nuclear program clear by inviting world organizations, including the EU and the non-aligned movement, to visit Iranian nuclear facilities. In the latest operation to dismantle Al-Qaeda's network, an Al-Qaeda cell consisting of 27 people was disbanded in Morocco. أعلنت السلطات المغربية تفكيك شبكة إرهابية ذات صلة بتنظيم القاعدة في بلاد المغرب. Moroccan authorities said a terrorist group linked to Al Qaeda was dismantled in Morocco. This came 10 days after the announcement that another six-person cell was shut down. The group was planning to use bomb-laden cars to launch terrorist attacks on foreign facilities and Moroccan security headquarters and centers. Moroccan Minister of Interior Tayeb Al Shargawi said the dismantled cell attempted to build a stronghold in the desert south of Al Ayoun city. The cell is 
comprised of 27 people and led by a native Moroccan who was a member of al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, based in northern Mali. The preliminary investigation of this cell discovered that it was recruiting former members of terrorist groups that had already been dismantled. The leadership of al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb assigned this mission to one of its members living in northern Mali. In an attempt for members of this group to gain fighting experience, a plan was formed to send some of them to al-Qaeda bases in Algeria and northern Mali for military training. Afterward, they were to return to the Kingdom of Morocco and proceed with their destructive terrorist plans using weapons they had stored in the region. Shargawi indicated that four of the cell's members were arrested while trying to cross the Moroccan-Algeria border. He also said members of this cell were involved in robbing banks and businesses that transport money in Casablanca and Rabat in order to finance their terrorist operations. الإرهابية. ذكرت وسائل إعلام تركية أن راكبا تركيا خطف طائرة. Turkish media outlet said a Turkish passenger claiming he had a bomb tried to hijack a Turkish airlines flight from Oslo to Istanbul shortly before it landed. Passengers, however, were able to get control of him. سيطروا عليه وعلى الأثر هرعت الشرطة إلى داخل الطائرة واعتقلت الراكب. Immediately after landing, policemen rushed onto the plane and arrested the hijacker. The police searched the plane and found no bomb. A security source said the man was from a Kurdish city near Anatolia and that he went to the aircraft cockpit about an hour before landing, demanding the pilot return to Oslo. However, the passengers were able to control the man and he was taken to the police center for questioning. The source indicated that the first-hand information of the investigation Investigation said the man suffers from a mental disorder. فن العرائس المتحرك فن قديم عادة ما يمثل ألوان الثقافة الحضارية وسلوك الحياة. Puppetry is an ancient art form that usually represents a society's culture and way of life. It is used to share certain ideas and concepts. For over 30 years, a Pakistani family has endeavored to save this cultural art from extinction after its popularity decreased in modern times. Our correspondent in Pakistan visited a theater run by the Perzada family in the city of Lahore and brought back the following report. <laughs> The art of puppetry in Pakistan is under threat of extinction despite efforts waged by pioneers of this art and the Ministry of Culture. The siblings who own Rafi Pier Theater in Lahore's outskirts sounded the cultural alarm to save puppetry from extinction. Since 1974, the Pirzada family has worked on extending the reach of this art form. The family has held international festivals to revive the art of puppetry. Despite these efforts, enthusiasts of this art form believe its popularity today is limited and only dwindling. Every year, the puppeteers are getting... Every year we try to revive this art. However, it is still very limited, especially because we have a problem attracting young men and women who want to learn this art. How are these puppets produced? Russia Today took a backstage tour of the theater and talked to its Romanian expert. There is more than one style of puppet. Some are made out of rods that the artists use to move the puppets. Some are string operated. Hand puppets are yet another style. According to Faizan Pirzada, a founder of the theater, issues would be simplified if it was up to the audience of puppet theaters. Besides tackling social, ethical, and educational issues, Faizan also tries to refl 
reflect on the political situation due to the theater's link to the Indian subcontinent and the Indian-Pakistani conflict. Arts in general. The arts in general are a great tool for getting rid of misunderstandings and breaking political barriers. This can be achieved for India and Pakistan through puppetry and music. However, this politicized artistic message did not please some extremist groups in the country. In 2009, the theater was the target of an explosion to which its owners reacted strongly. Despite all the challenges this art form faces, determination and willpower are the two forces essential to its survival. The artistic message remains the main and timeless message that will be disseminated through puppets in the theater, a message everyone is hoping will reach politicians in both countries. We can act as a bridge for peace between India and Pakistan. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.